Hello, and welcome to Burnett Avenue Baptist Church, where Reverend Daniel Corey Scholl is our pastor, and we affirm that Jesus makes life better.
Mark, the fourth chapter, fourth chapter of Mark's gospel, verses 35 through 41, the King James translation renders the Greek. Oh, you got, they got the message up there. We'll read it in the message. KJV means King James Version, but we'll read it in the message. Let us read together. Late that day, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. They took him in the boat as he was. Other boats came along. A huge storm came up. Waves poured into the boat, threatening to sink it. And Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow, sleeping. They roused him, saying, Teacher, is it nothing to you that we are going down? Awake now, he told the wind to pipe down, said to the sea, quiet, settle down. The wind ran out of breath. The sea became smooth as glass. Jesus reprimanded the disciples. Why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? Staggered. Who is this anyway? They asked. Wind and sea at his beck and call. I want you to hear it as you remain standing for just a moment. I want you to hear it in the King James. And the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? Say that. Repeat that after me. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? As you have your seats in the presence of the Lord, I want you to pray on this third watch of Senior Citizen Sunday on this subject, when fear trumps faith. All my bid whist players know what the word trumps me. When fear trumps faith. The disciples were doing what Jesus asked them to do. Come, let us pass over to the other side. And they ran into a storm. Now, the text says they ran into a great storm. A big storm came up unexpectedly. A huge storm came up out of nowhere while they were doing what the Lord asked them to do. How many times have you found yourself in a storm that came up unexpectedly? That came up out of nowhere? I'm talking to somebody worshiping here this Sunday. Somebody looking at me right now who feels stuck in a storm. A storm in your personal life. A storm in your married life. I heard the prayer this morning as Reverend prayed for the married couples and the married families. When I was a pastor, some of the most chilling words I heard was from married couples saying when they got home, their heart froze when the garage went up and they saw that the other car was already there. Because they knew they were walking into a storm. Stuck in a storm in your relationship life or stuck in a storm in your church life. Let me tell you a couple of three things the years have taught me about storms and trouble in our lives before I share with you what the Lord showed me concerning this text. Dr. William Augustus Jones was right, first of all. Dr. Jones, former pastor of the Bethany Baptist Church of Brooklyn, New York, a close friend of Frederick G. Sampson from Louisville, 
Dr. Jones, author of the powerful book, God in the Ghetto. Dr. Jones told our congregation 35 years ago that everybody under the sound of his voice that Sunday was in one of three different categories. They were either in a storm or they were coming out of a storm or they were heading into a storm and didn't even know it. Some storms come up out of nowhere. Some trouble that we run into on our journey is unexpected trouble. Number two concerning storms, there is no such thing as a storm-free existence. Somebody's missing that. Let me say it again. There is no such thing as a trouble-free existence. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor this. There's no such thing as a trouble-free life. It doesn't matter what you heard on television. It doesn't matter what you heard your favorite preacher say. It doesn't matter what your favorite gospel recording artist sang. There is no such thing as a trouble-free life. Now, before you run out of here and tell somebody what Jeremiah Wright is saying, contradicting what you heard about positive thinking and your word of faith theology, don't quote Jeremiah Wright, quote Jesus. Je Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation. In this life, you will run into some storms. In this life, you're going to have some trouble. In this life, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. There is no such thing as a trouble-free life. What does Psalm 27 say? The choir just sang it for you. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me. In this life, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to run into some storms. What does Psalm 46 say? Quote, Psalm 46 to your friends. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In this life, you're going to have some trouble. In this life, you'll run into some storms. What does Psalm 23 say? You all like Psalm 23. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of what? Mine enemies. Enemies means in this life, you're going to have some trouble. In this life, you're going to run into some storms. There is no such thing as a trouble-free life. Turn back to your neighbor and, and tell your neighbor, guess what that means? Look at him in the eyes. Smile at him and say, there's no such thing <laughs> as a trouble-free relationship. My son in the ministry, Freddie Haynes, puts it this way. He says, if the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, it might be because the water bill is higher on the other side of the fence. Somebody is paying a high price to keep up appearances, but there's no such thing as a trouble-free relationship. Dr. Lance Watson, Lance Watson says it's because of the differences in terms of our relationship trouble in communication. Men speak in headlines. Women talk in fine print. <laughs> communication analysts say men use on average 10,000 words a day. Women use 35,000 words a day. Check it out after service today. You get home, he's on the phone talking to say, where are you this morning? I was over at the net. Oh, what did Pastor Shaw preach about? There was this dude from Chicago there. That's the end of it. <laughs> Sister girlfriend on her phone said, girl, you ought to heard it while you do it. He brought me from a mighty long way. She was, a, she was on a fine print. Fine print. Speaking 10,000 words a day by the time the brother gets home in the evening, he has used 9,994 of those words. So when the lady asks him, how was your day? He uses his last six words, fine, what we got for dinner. <laughs> and he's through for the night. Dr. Watson came and preached. I don't know if you've heard him preach that sermon. Men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. In terms of our communication, men are like waffles. Next time you go to the Waffle House, next time you go to the Pancake House, next time you get in the refrigerator and pull out one of them little frozen waffles, look at it. There are boxes on them. 
little boxes. That's how men think and communicate. We have a wife box. We have a bill paying box. We have an NBA box. We have an Olympic box. We have a sex box. When we are in the NBA box, don't try to get us over in the sex box. We do one box at a time. You ever notice when you pour syrup on a, on a waffle, how inevitably there's always one box that the syrup goes all around and doesn't get, that is our nothing box. When we come home tired after work, we want to get in the nothing box and just chill. And then here y'all come. What you thinking about? His eyes go flashing around the kitchen. He got to find something to say because if he says nothing, he oh, so you don't want to tell me. We do one box at a time. Men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. Next time you have a plate of spaghetti, pick up one strand of the spaghetti and watch what happens. You will disturb 10 or 15 other strands. Y'all multitask all the time. You're talking on the phone, you're stirring the pot, you close the, forgot to close the door, you kick. Here you come home. By the way, who is Bobby? Bobby's been calling here all day long. And don't forget next Thursday. Next Thursday, how was your day today? I'm, I'm stuck back at Bobby. Your stream of consciousness. Now, Freddie Haynes says, in one way, Lance, Hain Lance Watson says it another way in terms of communication. I have explained it this way for many, many years. If the grass looks greener on the other side of that relationship fence, you better look again. Because it might just be artificial turf you're looking at. <laughs> There's no such thing as a trouble-free relationship. I'm saying I'm trying to help somebody here. Fifteen years ago, one of my sons in the ministry from Memphis, Dr. Ozzie Smith, who went to Olivet Church in Memphis, Dr. Ozzie Smith, who taught Kirk Whale and his acts, he liked what I said about the grass looking greener, artificial turf, and he went back to Memphis telling his mama, you ought to heard Pastor Wright, he said, the grass looks greener, it might be artificial turf. His mama is a Memphian. And his mama said, you go back and tell Pastor Wright, if the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, she's 85 years old. It might be because it's sitting on a septic tank. <laughs> now, for you youngsters who don't know what that means, that means there's a whole lot of poo-poo beneath you. <laughs> what you're looking at. If you are in a relationship, you're going to have trouble. Frankie Beverly and Mays call it what? Joy and it's like sunshine and rain. Joy and pain are part of what it means to be in a relationship. Now, Freddie Haynes, his first cousin is Frankie Beverly's business manager. And Frankie and Freddie are tight. And Frankie tries to get me, that's old school. Joy and pain, that's old school, Daddy J. That's old school. I'm 20 years older than Freddie. I told Freddie, you don't know what old school is. This is senior Sunday, so let me give you some OG old school <laughs> about trouble-free relationships. Ask any of the OGs, they can tell you. Tell me what's wrong with me now. Tell me why I never seem to make you happy though heaven knows I try. You say it's me, Rocky. I say it's you. We have got to get together, or be we're through. Break up to make that's all we do. 
First you love me, then you hate me. That's a game for there's no such thing as a trouble-free relationship. Turn back to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I got one more thing to tell you. Not only is there no such thing as a trouble-free life, not only is there no such thing as a trouble-free relationship, there is also no such thing as a trouble-free church. Getting into a church is like getting into that boat in verse 36. You're getting into the old ship of Zion and you are journeying with Jesus. But sooner or later, you're going to run into some trouble. An unexplained storm will come up out of nowhere. No such thing as a trouble. Three free church. Now, those are the things I learned about storms. Number one, everybody in here is in one of three categories. You're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or heading into a storm. Number two, no such thing as a trouble-free existence. And number three, that, that leads me to what this text teaches me. Many times when the storm is fierce enough, it will cause fear to overrule faith. The reason I wanted you to hear it in King James is look what Jesus says in verse 40 in the King James translation. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Fierce storms sometimes, the years have taught me that fierce storms many times cause fear to overrule faith. Fierce storms many times cause fear to win out over faith. Fear storms can cause your fears to trump your faith. How many times have you heard somebody else say, I don't want you to confess, somebody else said this. You might have thought it to yourself. I didn't have this kind of trouble when I was in the world. I didn't catch this kind of hell until I got in church. Go back to my opening sentence. The disciples were doing what Jesus asked them to do. And they ran into a storm. They ran into a great storm. A big storm came up out of nowhere. A huge storm came up unexpectedly while they were doing what the Lord asked them to do. And a fierce storm caused fear to trump their faith. Now look at this text with me, if you will, and see what happens when fear trumps faith. While you're in a storm, even if you're not in a storm in your personal life, even if you're not in the storm physically, if you're not in the storm spiritually, your married life, your relationship life, or in your church life, I got a hot flash for you in case you had not noticed. We are all in a storm in our country's life. Mass incarceration, health care inequities, wealth gap inequities, the destruction of public education, disregard for black lives from Ferguson to Flint, militarized police, tanks, Humvees, body armor in our streets. How far have we come from the bombs in Birmingham and Martin Luther King's day to the murder of black men and women in Barack Hussein Obama's day? How far have we come from the murder of Emmett Till by white racists to the murder of Freddie Gray by white and black police, all of whom got off? How far have we come from the shooting and murder of Medgar Evers to the shooting and murder of Trayvon Martin? How far have we come from the white robe wearing terrorists of the Ku Klux Klan to the poison water distribution in Flint and Detroit, Michigan? How far have we come from the killings by lead in the bullet to the killings by lead in the water? In case you haven't noticed, we are in a huge storm. And with the nominee whose name for the Republican Party is in the title of this sermon, When Fear Trumps Faith, a misogynist, racist, sexist, Muslim-hating, Mexican-hating, bold, brash, billionaire, saying out loud publicly what racists have been saying on the DL privately for at least eight years. Why do you think Trump won all those primaries? His finger is on the pulse of the racist majority in this country. One finger's on the pulse, his other finger's on the nuclear triple. The trigger of a pistol paid for by the NRA. In case you had not noticed, we are in a huge storm and we're heading for a hurricane. 
But I stopped by the net to warn somebody not to let the fierceness of this storm allow your fears to trump your faith. Why? Because when fear trumps faith, the text says, believers forget. Turn to your neighbor and say, believers forget. First, believers forget what the sovereign said. In verse 35 of today's text, he said, let us go over to the other side. He did not say, let us go under. The waves are swamping into the boat. He didn't say, let us drown together. No, he said, let us go over. They forgot what he said. When fear trumps faith, we forget too many times what he said. What did he say about storms? Isaiah 43. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Don't forget what he said. What did he say? Isaiah 54. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Don't forget what he said. What did he say? Psalm 30. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Don't forget what he said. What did he say? Hebrews 13. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that segues into the second things that believers forget. When fear trumps faith, the text says the first things believers forget was what he said. The second things believers forget was where they were. Where were they? They were with him on a journey to the other side. He said, let us go over. And they took him, verse 36 says, with them. He was right there with him. They were not alone in the storm. They were with him in the storm. He was with them in the storm. And he will be with you through your storm. He will be with us through this storm. Don't forget what he said and don't forget where you are and who you're with. That's bad grammar, but good theology. (laughs) Who are you with in the storm? Come on back to Isaiah 43 again. The sovereign says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the storms, I will be with you. And please don't miss that word, T-H-R-O-U-G-H, through. A storm is something you go through. Storms don't last forever. Trouble don't last forever. The Africans enslaved in the storm of human bondage sang, I'm so glad trouble don't last. Always a storm is something you go through. Charles Albert Tenley, the African-American Methodist pastor, great hymn writer, wrote a song sung by the mass choir, Take Courage, My Soul, Let Us Journey On. Though the night is dark, it won't be very long. Thanks be to God, the morning light appears. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Remember where you are. You're on a journey going through. Remember who you're with and remember who is with you as you go through. When fear trumps faith, the text says, believers forget. First, they forget what the sovereign said. Then they forget where they are. They're with him and he's with them. Matthew 14, 28 is one of my favorite companion scriptures about us as believers when we get caught in a storm or stuck in a storm. 36 years ago, I was stuck in a storm. And in my morning devotion, Matthew 14, 28 helped me make sense of that storm. Let me see the daddies here who are fathers or have been fathers of teenage daughters. 36 years ago, I had a teenage daughter who was 14, and she was in love. I was stuck in the storm. She's in love with a Negro who was 19 years old. I didn't like him or his mama. I'm, I'm taking my 14-year-old to school, letting her out of my car, watching her. She walks in the front door to school, pulling away, not knowing that his mama's sitting on the side door where she's coming out the side door to play hooky. And she's taking her, my daughter, to her house, giving her reefer so she can get high and her son can have sex. We went to therapy. And the therapist said, we have to have a meeting of the parents. I ain't had no meeting. I had murder on my mind. I'm stuck in a storm and I'm waiting. I'm, I'm told you all heard me talking to the Lord. When are you going to say peace be still? 
I'm going to carry us down. Now, you know, get up, Jesus. Say something. You did it for them. How come you ain't going to do it for me? And in my morning devotion, I read Matthew 14, 28. You ought to read that. The disciples were caught in a storm in Matthew 14. Jesus saw they were caught in a storm, and he walked out to, to be with them. And he said, don't be afraid. It's me. Now, we always put the focus when we read that story about Peter saying, was that really you? Yeah, it's me. So tell me to walk and come to you. He said, come on. He started walking. We focus. If you notice, Jesus didn't stop that storm. There's some storm the Lord don't stop. Sometimes he doesn't calm the storm for the believers. He just calms the believers who's stuck in the storm. Just his presence. His presence calms my doubt and soothes my fear when he stands with you in the form. And that points to the ultimate thing some believers forget when fear trumps faith. It's in this text. Look at verse 41 which says, They were still afraid. They feared exceedingly. And then they said to, to each other, What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him? That tells me this. They not only forgot what he said, Let us go over. They not only forgot where they were, us means they were with him, he was with them. They also forgot who he was. Say what he said, say that. Where they were and who he was. In verse 38, they called him master. Master, carest thou not that we, but they forgot that he was not only their master, he was also the master of ocean and earth and sky. They forgot who he was. All things were made by him, John said, and without him was not anything made that was made. They forgot who he was. He was the same Jesus who rode through 42 generations of the prophets, who in Mark 1 cured a man who had come to church with the devil in him. Can you imagine that? Somebody in church with the devil in him? If you come into his presence, he can get out of you anything that keeps you from being in the right relationship with him. They forgot who he was. He was the same Jesus who went to Simon Peter's house after church and lifted his mother-in-law up off her sickbed, restoring wholeness to her body. They forgot who he was. He was the same Jesus who healed like a doctor man, taught like a teacher man, fed 5,000 like a grocery man. They forgot who he was. Don't forget in the midst of the mess that we are in as we go through this storm that he's the same Jesus today that he was on yesterday. He's the same Jesus who not only rode through 42 generations of the prophets, he also rode in the belly beneath the decks of stinking slave ships, calming his believers who cried out, Lord, have mercy. Don't forget who he is. He's the same Jesus who made 19 trips back into the south with Harriet Tubman to free enslaved Africans from the storm of slavery that they were living. Don't forget who he is. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't forget who he is. He's the same Jesus who walked the dusty roads of Galilee and walked the segregated streets of Montgomery, Alabama to bring a racist bus company down to his knees. Don't forget who he is. He's the same Jesus who spoke out on a stormy sea and who spoke to heal the daughter of a Syrophoenician sister, a black woman, and who spoke and healed the servant of a Roman centurion, a white man. He's the same Jesus who speaks and demons tremble. The same Jesus who speaks and his voice is so sweet that the birds got to hush their singing. He's the same Jesus who is still speaking today. He's the same Jesus who walks with me when the media messes with me and folk walk away from me. He talks with me when other so-called friends talk about me. He's the same Jesus who tells me I am his own. I have redeemed you. You are mine. He's the same Jesus who exchanged his life for mine. He's, don't forget who he is. He's the same Jesus who thought I was worth saving. Now, I'm almost through. I'm almost through, but I got to tell you something. See, saints, saints like, like Pastor Shaw have been in the church all their lives. But I get tickled when we hear these discussions about black power versus millennials and folk leaving the church, so forth and so on. Because I wasn't in the church all my life. I left the church. In my senior year of college, I quit school rather than go to, into seminary. I quit school and joined the United States Marine Corps. I didn't do church. I'm through with church. 
I got tired of Negroes in the choir one day. He gave my solo to her. He know that's my solo. I tired of all this church fighting and stuff. I left the church. I ain't had nothing to do with no church. Except when I went to Philadelphia to visit my parents. I ain't, no, I ain't stupid. <laughs> but while I was stationed at Camp Lejeune, while I was stationed at Bethesda, I ain't do no church. Through a church. And one Saturday June, in June of 1966, I was sitting on the church step house in Rockville, Maryland. The church was closed up tight. Wasn't nothing going on. Saturday afternoon. And me and two of my partners were sitting on the church steps solving the problems of the world <laughs> with a fifth of Taylor Port wine. <laughs> Taylor Port wine will make you a philosopher. <laughs> this was the year after Malcolm X, El Haji, and Malik Shabazz had been killed. And we were sitting there saying the Muslims did it. The black Muslims killed him. They shut him up. We were giving the Muslims the blues. We were giving the church the blues and all this racism, all these white pictures from the Renaissance, people sitting at the table like Italians. That's not how they ate in the first century in Palestine, sitting at no table like Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo had a white man printed up on the ceiling, God, and the white man, Adam, all the lies they were telling about, and all these jack leg preachers tagging everything going, talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I see what I want. Oh, we were dogging the church. We were dogging religion, tearing religion up. We threw a religion. And this old dude walked up and got into conversation with us. And he tried to defend the church. And I was eating his lunch. I was tearing him up. <laughs> and I offered Harry another drink. And he said he didn't want it. He don't want no more. That's more for me. <laughs> and this old dude trying to defend. I said, no, let's talk about the Renaissance. Let's talk about, okay, on what continent does everything between Genesis and Malachi take place? Name the seven continents. He named the seven continents. I said, on what continent does everything take place? He wanted to make an eighth continent. <laughs> now, they taught you in school, Africa, Asia, North America, South America, A Antarctica, Australia, and Europe, right? What continent does everything in the Bible take place in the Old Testament? He, here he come with the eighth continent, the Middle East. That, that ain't no continent. <laughs> That's a lie. That's a lie. Yeah, I just and offered Alec another drink. He didn't want no more to drink either. They don't want no more to drink. That's still more for me. See, these brothers knew that this old dude who got in the conversation with us was the pastor of the church whose steps we were sitting on. <laughs> I didn't live around there. I didn't know that. They, they knew that. And when they, one of them slipped and said, Reverend Brooks, I said, Reverend? They said, yeah, he the pastor. Well, hey, about this much wine left in the bottle, it's on like neck bones now. It's going down like four flat tires. We got into it. Me and that old man, we talked for four hours. My partners left me. At the end of four hours, he handed me his card. He said, son, I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to try to answer the question today. And it's not because of the wine. The wine been gone. He said, here's my card. Give me a call when you get an answer to this question. I hear you mad at what racism has done to Christianity. I hear you mad at what jack leg preachers have done to Christianity. I hear you mad at what church folk have done to Christianity. But I don't hear you mad with Jesus. I don't hear you mad with the church that Jesus founded. I hear you mad and upset with what has happened to the church. So here's my question. I get the feeling that you love the church very much. Now, where do you think you can do the most good loving the church as much as I suspect you love the church? Inside the church, working to make it become what the Lord meant when he said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Or on the outside, throwing stones at him. When you get an answer here, you give me a call. I took his card and went home. That was Saturday afternoon. Sunday morning, y'all, I got up, started getting ready for church. I was going to check out, check out what this old dude said on Sunday. Now, my wife, my wife said, remember, we don't do church, remember? We don't do church. Six years I've been in the service, we don't do church. She said, where are you going? I said, to church. Come on, let's go. Come on, go with me. I think, sisters, I think she said, what's the witch's name? <laughs> That's what it sounded like. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. Look, look, look at this card. This dude, 
remember the old dude I told you about? We, we, here's his card. We got in this conversation yesterday, and he got a good rap on the sidewalk. I want to see what he sounds like in, on Sunday morning. I'm going, come on and go with me. She said, no, that's your thing. You go ahead. And I went to the church, but I went like some of y'all. Now, some of y'all had never heard of Jeremiah Wright until the media stopped messing with me in 2008. And you came out here this morning critical. I ain't stupid. And that's how I went to church. I went critical. I had my pen and paper. I went to criticize everything they were doing. I got there critical. I got there just as the devotion was starting. Troy can tell you, this is long before we had praise team. Young people, we didn't used to have praise team. They had deacons lined up in front of the church. And the deacons, they would give you the nod when it was time for your testimony. And the deacons were singing. And they weren't singing no praise team. They weren't singing no Richard Smallwood, no Donald Lawrence. They were singing, I, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. I, 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 I When they finish, when they finish, they go to moaning. Mm, see? Mm. I'm not moaning like that. Then Deacon Jones pulled a chair up. Deacon Jones pulled a chair up and knelt down beside the chair. I had never been in that church. I had never met Deacon Jones in life. But I could say his prayer right along with him. Most holy, all wise, and everlasting God, our Heavenly Father. Tis once more again. And a few of your humble servants. Come before you. We come with our head bowed toward our mother dust, with our hearts turned toward thee. We come because we know you, God. Use God all by yourself, and you don't need nobody else. Use God a long time ago, scooped out the seas with the palm of your hand, and walled it up with the pebbles in. You God, give us the kind of religion that runs from heart to heart and breast to breast. Give us the kind of heart religion that makes a dancing woman pull her, hang up her shoes, make a gambling man throw away his car. Give it and win, 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 win. When, 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 when the choir have sang the last anthem and the preacher has prayed the last prayer, when the Bible lay closed on the altar and the song have died out on there, give us a home and I can't hear Joseph do something. This is the same prayer. Everybody been praying that prayer. They prayed that prayer. So I grew up hearing that prayer. The devotions ended. They handed the mic back into the pulpit and the willing and able choir took the choir stand. <laughs> Y'all know what the willing and able choir is? That's where you got more folk who are willing <laughs> than folk who are able. The P. Nana, they had a P. Nana, the piano upright, the P. Nana hit, hit a chord, doom. Let the words of my mouth, let the words of my mouth, hang a second. This is the one on that screeching. What the fuck is that? that, is, that. They sang the Lord's Prayer. They chanted the Lord's Prayer. And then they, they did the opening hymn. And then the Willing and Able Choir came out of the choir stand. And the Calvary Crusaders, I don't know if you know Henry Davis. Henry Davis classmate of Richard Smallwood, one of the co-founders of the Howard University Gospel Choir. Henry stood on the Hammond B3 and the Calvary Crusaders came into the choir stand. Now, listen carefully. I don't want you to miss what I'm getting ready to say. This was 1966. In 1966, I was homophobic. Thank God I've been cured of that disease. Thank God the Lord has taken that demon out of my life. I'm not there. But in 66, I was homophobic. And while Henry was playing the, the introduction to the song, the soloist glided to the mic. I said, see, that's right there. That's why black men don't go to church. Ain't nobody going to hear no mess like, what is, what is this? The brother started singing to her. He sang like Luther Vandross. Come. I said, well, we all have different gifts. Let me cross them. <laughs> Then Reverend Brooks started preaching, y'all, and he preached from what has become my mantra, Matthew 16. 
They came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus said unto his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They say, Well, some say that you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're Isaiah, one of the prophets. Jesus said, That's nice. Who do you say that I am? Don't forget who he is. He said, Because the ultimate question is, it sounded like he was talking to me, picking up the conversation we'd had on the steps of the church the day before, where I was drinking wine. He said, It's not who Elijah Muhammad says he is. Who do you say he is? It's not who El Haj El Malik El Shabazz says he is. Who do you say he is? It's not who Louis Farrakhan says he is. Who do you say he is? It's not who Buddhists say he is. Who do you say he is? It's not who the Hindus say he is. Who do you say he is? It's not who your mama said he is. Who do you say he is? It's not who your grandmama say he is. Who do you say he is? Don't forget who he is. It's not who your grandfather says he is. Who do you say he is? All day long Saturday, he kept saying, you're right, son. You're right, son. As I was jamming him, and all day Sunday while he was preaching, I was saying, you're right, sir. You're right, sir. You're right, sir. And when they opened the doors of the church, I came running down the aisle crying like a baby because he thought I was worth saving. He thought I was worth changing. He stepped into my life. He changed my life so I could be free, so I could be whole, so I could be unashamedly black, unapologetically Christian. I don't have to give up my Africanity for my Christianity. I know who my Savior is. I know who I am. I know who he is. Don't forget who he is. Who is he? Mary's baby. Who is he? He thought I was worth saving. He took me from drinking wine on the steps of the church to serving wine in communion. Ah, so I can be free. So I can be whole. I'll praise him forever. I'll praise him. Is there anybody beside me here who knows that he stepped into your life? He cleaned you up. He changed your life. Come on now. Don't, be, don't fool me. Don't fool me. Don't fool me. Don't fool me. Don't fool him. He's looking at you right now. If the Lord has turned your life around and you know that you know that you know that you know that you know he's real. Come on and give God some praise. Give God some undignified praise. Burnett Avenue is located at 6800 South Hurstbourne Parkway in Louisville, Kentucky. Join us for Sunday worship at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and 12 noon. Saturday service is at 6 p.m. and midweek Bible study Wednesdays at 7 p.m. For more information, give us a call at 491-8301.